Right, welcome back. I think, uh, yes, I uh, had just to sort out my mic there, a bit of a technical problem. That's why you had all the cartoons to watch and uh, decipher. And of course, this is what we've been having in the dailies today, looking at the shilling and the way now it is from the ICU. It is uh, in the HDU. We hope now it will just go to the general ward. And after the general ward now, it will go home to back to where it was. It's a relief for the president, as you can see it there. And also the chief of the presidential uh, economic council advisors there, that is David D, holding court with the CS. And uh, Henry Rotich, by the way, we never talked about Henry Rotich and him declining, uh, do you know, that particular appointment by the president. He declined. Yeah, he says he's still waiting for maybe being restated, a restatement uh, to the central bank. Yeah. Yeah, it seems also it is, uh, I can see it loading on all of you, you're not aware. All right. So we can see this is also what, what is it. What this the ICAD was different, that he has taken over the responsibility of... Of which are, of the advisor, the uh, what's her name again, Henry? Yeah, he declined. So yeah, this is what also we do have. Inside. When did he decline? Well, he, the, the reasons are known advisor. to him. No, no. What? I, did, I didn't get that. The appointment of the being a presidential advisor on budgetary policy. Oh, budget and fiscal and policy. Physical policy and physical yes, policy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is what we do have also inside the star today. Uh, Drilo Dinga there. <laughs> And uh, really what is happening within Azimio? Hmm. Right. Uh, you can see everyone actually is floating every which way. Where did he? Where did there, you know, show? in the buffer, uh, right. floating. Uh, and we have also Kalonzo Musioka and Eugene Omalo in the same docket right now. Uh, we have uh, the Kamene <laughs> section. And this is how the Azimio is looking. <laughs> Wajakoya is alone. Yeah. yeah. Wajakoya is a lone ranger there. <laughs> <laughs> this what is, is that box? Right. But the what is it they are fishing? Except uh, politicians. The, yes. Except the Marjorie affair. Well, it seems that Zimio is uh, on a, this is a Noah's Ark, yeah, ma, uh, on the Mount <laughs> on Mount Arat, so to speak. <laughs> are they <too laughs> waiting for the floods mm, so that it can take off? Well, I don't know. I leave it for you to decipher. And Valentine's was there as well. That was yesterday. Everyone was celebrating Valentine's, but you can see who are being given the flowers there, right? Uh, the divide uh, between the rich and the poor, this is what I think Stano is trying to decipher there. By the way, I was just reading also on the benefit of love. Uh, I'll show you much, much later what. And the fake doctors, we, we shall discuss about the fake doctors as well. Uh, there is uh, that particular report from uh, the Public Service Commission on uh, fake doctors, uh, fake <coughs> police as is being depicted here. I, I think my cartoon is delaying <laughs> to take up we go in concert with what I'm talking about. But welcome back. You're watching Sokoni here on the Morning Prime. We continue pace with the conversation with the panelists holding court with the chair of Kenya Diaspora Alliance. This is Shemu Chodo. And also we have a chair of Kenya Development Corporation. This is Bunyasi Sakwa. We have also with us Professor Gituru Wanainas from School of Business, Nairobi, and also Professor Exan Iraqi from uh, School of Business of Nairobi as well. Right, before we took a short break, I think uh, you wanted to chime in. I've lost my track of thoughts. My mic has thrown me off completely. <laughs> it's about uh, <laughs> Modi's interest rate. Yes, yes, we will we discuss about Modi's, but we are not actually completed on the issue of trade deficit. And I think you're talking about the coffee sector mm. uh, reforms. And you're asking how that coffee sector reforms is bringing any uh, exceeding, exceedingly beneficial value right now because the, what we need to target on is on the value chain. That's right. not really happening. And looking at that particular report that we just read, <coughs> tea, <coughs> coffee, amongst other cash crops, uh, there's nothing much that uh, is happening as far as the export is concerned. I don't know. Uh, you can actually, mm. yeah, excellent Iraqi. Yes, uh, I, I can chip in. Uh, because if you look at UDA manifesto, and even as a manifesto, variation was very big. <laughs> you look at even uh, vision 2030. Yes, yes. If you look at better, the better economic transformation model is all about the same. But my big concern is when I travel to the Kenyan rural areas in the last 12 years since we got the new constitution, what I see most are new hotels, not new factories. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I support the government effort to make sure that uh, we have industrial parks because that can really transform the rural areas. So I hope that idea, I agree with my colleague here, should be, should be realized. Because if we, if we don't value add, then uh, whatever we export will be raw value and we are not going to get the returns as expected. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to say something. It's uh, when you look at value addition, and, and, and we struggled this at the Vision 2030, the economic pillar. Basically, the thrust was add value in our product and services. It, it takes me to, uh, to, to President Nana of Ghana. Uh, when he was very deliberate in uh, Switzerland and to the parliament that uh, we shall not be exporting coffee bean, cocoa beans mm -hmm. anymore. We'll be exporting Nesca, uh, sorry, uh, chocolate. chocolate. Right. If you look at the spiral of things which happened in Ghana, it actually brought, almost brought Ghana to his knees. And therefore, when you talk about you, the issue of value odd, you have to see the big picture in terms of the nerves you are touching. Mm. There's nothing strategic. There's nothing strategically, economically, politically, whatever you want to like, food. <coughs> and you're right. <coughs> uh, the late uh, A.G. Karuga, I can't remember his name, he had actually coffee. And was telling us, if I export this coffee, when it comes back and finish, it's ten, ten times. Ten times. Right. And uh, March this year, if you went to this Mombasa in terms of selling coffee and how much they were selling a kilo, and you go to Java today, it's almost 800% over. So there's a lot of value in value addition. And that's what Flora was saying. Uh, and she has been very keen. She's a tea farmer. She understands the market of that. What does it then entail? It entails to go the Indian way. We must produce our own mchele. It must go to what South Korea, actually scientists this week, it was interesting, uh, this week, they are actually producing rice which has beef in it. So it's not the ordinary. I think they got the, some DNA from the beef put in the plant, and now it's coming is mchere lakini kona nyama. Vitamins. <laughs> yeah. So, so you go to your starch and protein combined. Combined. Yeah, so, <laughs> so when you look at agriculture, it's key. It's <coughs> at the end of the day. GMO. It's GMO. Mm. At the end of the day, you and I must eat. And it's a fundamental human right requirement. So when we talk of value add, we have to be careful of people in town making, no, 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 no. We still need to export the greens for you guys. Yeah. So it's a good idea. It's fantastic. I wish coffee we could do that. But it requires a lot of political strong men and women, like what uh, your first home, is this the first or second home, has done. Right. Very strong in coffee. Second. They're exporting, actually, they're not exporting beans anymore. That leadership has to come very strongly. They have gone the cocoa way. Mm. By the way, it's interesting, the, the name of the cocoa tree is called, where there is a no, you put a knee. The seeds remain the same. I didn't know about that. <laughs> the cacao. The product, yes, cacao. Mm -hmm. Where there is a no, you put a knee. Where is a river, you put <laughs> All right. Okay, <laughs> let's move on now. We see what is happening also with the agency and the banking sector here. Where are the global ratings? Agency Moody's has changed its outlook on the Kenyan banks to negative from stable, citing concerns about high volumes of non-performing loans despite solid profitability and liquidity levels. The volume of non-performing loans in the local banking sector rose by 133.6 billion shillings to 621.3 billion shillings in the 12 months to December 2023, accounting for 14.8% of the sector's loan book. And uh, the deteriorating of the assets book has reflected the general economic difficulties facing borrowers, including high interest rates and inflation, piling pending bills, and reduced demand for goods and services. Despite solid economic growth, an array of challenges will weigh on borrowers' credit worthiness and create difficult operating conditions for banks through 2024. This is what Modi said in its analysis. These challenges for borrowers encompass rising interest rates, increased taxes, reduced government spending, high inflation, high uh, foreign currency shortages, and government delays in settling outstanding bills. Consequently, uh, problems uh, loan will rise. And then factors such as the elevated price of goods and services, new statutory deductions including housing levy, 
and increase interest rates in line with the higher central bank rate now at 13 percent the highest point in 12 years have combined to weaken borrowers ability to service loans weighted average lending rates for banks stood at 14.63 percent in december the highest since august 2016 when it averaged 17.66 percent the moody's outlook does not constitute a credit rating action however but it is instead a view of credit fundamentals in the banking sectors uh, sector over the next 12 to 18 months the agency's concern about the high volumes of non-performing loans is largely due to the impact this has on the profitability of banks which are forced to raise their provisioning uh, whenever there is a jump in the stock of bad loans. Uh, we can talk about that briefly and what it does really pretend moving forward. Uh, we can begin with you, Punyasi Sakwa. Um, first of all, um, this uh, Moody's rating about performance of banks uh, is almost, um, almost a no-brainer, one can say, because uh, it, it derives from the fact that uh, the economy has had problems, the new investments, investment flows have diminished, business is uh, depressed, uh, and so on. And therefore, banks are likely to, you know, to face the consequences of that, those constraints from, uh, um, uh, from the cash flow. We, in, in the banking sector, KDC is, is the largest public development bank that we have. Um, are facing the, the pinch as well. Uh, the economy is not doing well and therefore your loan repayments are, mm. are going to be withheld. Uh, people are unsure about the next three or four or five or six months, so they would hold the payment. I remember visiting uh, uh, one of our loan beneficiaries and they had done quite well and then suddenly they weren't paying. So when we went to meet the CEO, she said, uh, if you can assure me that I can get, she was owing only uh, 500 a million shillings uh, that she could have paid but did not pay. She said, if I'm guaranteed that I can get that money uh, in two weeks, if I need it, I'll pay. So which means she had the money to pay, but she felt that why would I lose that, uh, that money out of my cash mm -hmm. when I can't replenish it? And then, you know, consequences are going to be more serious. So uh, the consequences that Moody is predicting uh, are um, almost, almost obvious. One of the sectors unlike the 70s and 80s that has been making real abnormal profits have been the banks uh, even during the pandemic yeah. and everybody else was <coughs> tittering on uh, exactly yes and they, even when you look at this as well it's, it's the non-performing loans yes. but it's still you know floating uh, on liquidity uh, yes, yeah. yes. so so it's not really the citizenry or maybe the banking sector that is there's actually to be benefiting yes but it is a trading with the government and if you also look at the cumulative impact in fact since the pandemic of uh, profits and losses cumulative. The banks are still ahead. They are not, they are, it's not as if it's, go, it's uh, near anywhere sinking, but this threat of uh, uh, growing non-performing loans, a huge part of it could become, could become a threat because one of their sources of earning is going to be you know, directly, directly uh, uh, hit. And this is also a warning to you as well as uh, KDC? Yes, yes, we, we worry about that. You know, we, will look, we are looking uh, internally at what we can do uh, to sort of place ourselves in a little more advantageous position, but it is a worrying, uh, it's a worrying trend. And as you can expect, uh, those in the public sector <coughs> institutions, ownership will now have an impact on uh, how, 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 you, how you get and come out of this, that uh, public sector institutions will probably uh, suffer more than private sector ones would do because of fear of uh, uh, fear of action, you know, the public, private sector have no limit to how far they can take you uh, in terms of recovering their money. The public sector can have a pushback, some sort of uh, pushback and sympathy that, you know, government is doing badly, you know, ease off, go easy and so on. But um, I just wanted to make uh, one last comment on this, uh, that these rating agencies, uh, uh, Moody, Standard & Poor and uh, any others that might be, let us remember that these are uh, institutions of the club. Um, and, 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 and there are bigger issues about this than just the modeling and the, and the mathematics around what they do. Uh, there's something also related to what conclusions. Earlier on, Professor here had, had uh, said something about 
how actions of countries may reflect the thinking of uh, the Bretton Woods institutions mm -hmm. like IMF and others. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is that uh, um, even economics itself, as we have learned it, and I think the professors who are much more current on this will know, uh, we had learned colonial economics. Uh, we were told, don't waste time processing mm -hmm. the bean. Uh, if it's more profitable to export the bean, uh, and if you process, you may reduce, you know, in fact, the net earnings on it later mm. because the market will not accept and so on. And I remember in a practical way, I was in Ghana uh, leading a team that was looking at cocoa sector reforms some years back. And uh, we were pushing, the, the, the losses by Ghana cocoa marketing board were huge. And uh, uh, we were saying they should do more value addition, mm. but this was a conceptual framework you know, do more value addition, they were talking about our coffee and so on. The depth of uh, uh, value addition in cocoa and coffee is similar, tea is a bit different. So they've, they were told, uh, the Ghanaians, uh, pushing back on, on World Bank uh, ideas about value addition said, oh, by the way, we've been told by, um, I don't know if it was Nescafe or some group in Switzerland, that uh, if we Ghana can, can invest in a factory, they could do so in Portugal, because Portugal was uh, a cheap destination to go and install. Yeah. A Ghana processing factory, but built in Portugal. <laughs> it, would, it would have a better global impact. If they do it in Ghana, they, nobody will buy. They said, we, we won't be able to buy your powder. Why? Oh, because you know, nobody will want to buy that, which has been, it has been done in Africa, you know, and, and, and so on. You can imagine that. It has nothing to do with economics, it has nothing to do with mm -hmm. the it was it had all to do with attitude and so these institutions are working within a, a, an atmosphere we must remember that they are instruments of the club and i think it's very important for economists to begin to outgrow to outgrow this we can't expect it from those whose uh, origins are these institutions i'm also in a way absolutely i, I, I used, to be, but point. Nice yes. used to be a member of a club yeah, yeah. Is yeah. That, <laughs> a, a, a club can i, can I support club Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I think I like, I like the, the direction you're taking. Because one of the questions I've always asked is, if you look at Africa, we have some banks that are doing very well, Equity Bank, Access Bank, and so on. And they have even done very well across the borders. So what is so hard with getting an African-based rating agency? Must we be rated by Moody's? Must we be rated by Standard and Poor? And that brings us to our attitudes. Our attitude, we believe that some people do things better than us including the names that we have on non-performing loans. <laughs> it was obvious that if you increase the interest rates, the non-performing rates will go up. Now, if you add in what was happening before, during COVID-19, and you compound with the rising interest rates, then you can see why the non-performing rates are going up. But you're also forgetting that it's not just banks that are complaining about non-performing loans, even individuals. I'm sure all of you, if I asked you, tell me one or two friends of yours who have changed their phone numbers, they don't want to pay. They don't want to pay the money that they owe you. No, I've muted giving anybody money. <laughs> you can see. <laughs> but I think that before I finish, the bigger question we should be asking is, if you look at Kenya's economic growth rate in the last five years and projected up 2027, it's over 5%. So the economy is growing, but it seems people are not making enough money to pay back their loans, which now takes back what we have been discussing earlier, that it has become very difficult to do business. And this growth that is not taking a bigger number of Kenyans probably shows there is increasing, increasing inequality. So, so, so I, I think we need to go back and ask, how do we help people make money, retain jobs, so they're able to pay their loans? Because <coughs> I don't think people are deliberately refusing to pay their loans. No. The economic circumstances <coughs> no. is forcing them, not, forcing them not to pay. So let's, in, in, let's improve the working environment, the economic environment. People will make money and they will pay their non performing loans. Maybe, maybe to lean on him, maybe two things. A, <coughs> when Moody says you are moving from stable to negative, who picks that signal? Because they are guys. They say, that's not a country to invest. That's true. That's what they, they'll pick it. And as much I agree with that, and uh, we should come have one leading ourselves. But the moment that signal, there are people take are shy. And that comes to what you're saying earlier on. The uptake in at the NSC, I don't see it happening. When you have people like Moody coming in, mm -hmm. uh, this but perhaps and more fundamental, 
and I think Iraqi touched on it, is a question why are there non-performing loans? And it's a person, a human being, making a very rational decision. You can even take to the rural level. I owe Iraqi 30,000. I don't have food in my house. Should I pay him or buy food? Take at the country level. You have borrowed this, it's expensive. Is my responsibility as a family to feed the family or pay? Now, that could be what's happening. Now, the consequences of that is the banks now start coming in. And they're very good when you actually don't pay. And, and I, I, I do, I can attest to what you're saying, correct. I do have an opportunity to, to do their current strategic plan. And one of their key resort areas is those performing loans. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it was worrying. Mm -hmm. I could imagine now it's, it's more concern. Mm -hmm. So you still have to look at the fundamentals and, 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 uh, of really why people are not paying. Why are people, because I'm being taxed left and right, really. I'm, I'm sorry, sounding like a broken leg or bring this new bar. So what do I do? I'll switch off the phone. I'll block <laughs> Hiraki because he has my arm is money. <laughs> the, the, the bar, I probably would give credit to our banks, uh, the commercial banks uh, in particular, that despite the non-performing loans, you know, the irony is that they're still very liquid and profitable. I think they are fairly innovative. They could be more innovative. Is it, is it innovation or is it actually trading with government have just, we've just um, raised? Because now the, 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 the bonds this thing just uh, and the bills as well. The yeah. well. What is the innovation you're the actually bulk, talking about? The, 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 the bulk, that could, could be up some billions. That could be one way. I think the government infrastructure bonds. Yes, that's the one. I that's think the innovation. there's now a little longer period. I think um, the new one being introduced, they say minimum 10 year period or something like that. I don't have the full details. But that could be just one of the major ways. I think to be fair to the banks, I don't think it's only that. Because I know, for example, most of the major tier one banks are also now into what we call bank assurance. They're also providing insurance services. And they're coming on board with other products as well, which I think we need to encourage them to do. But having said that, the bal, and, and I also had, uh, I think the cabinet resolved yesterday, DBK, I would want to assume that was part of KDC. Yeah, we're coming to that if that's where you're going. No, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to focus on reinsurance because the risk that's happening with non-performing non, non loans, uh, how, to what extent are we cautioning our financial institutions? My understanding was when Kenya Re was formed, the idea was to cushion the financial sector, particularly the insurance. Why is it that we are not reinsuring reinsurers? And why is it that Kenya Re, in my assessment, and as a small shareholder, there are times I get a, a dividend of 20 shillings, 30 shillings. You know, it doesn't make sense. I was thinking that Kenya Re, if it was meant, if it was run the way it was intended, should be a very fluid body. In fact, we should be looking at having a, re a super or a hyper insurance that reinsures the reinsurers, what they call retrocession. Because then, currently, there's quite a bit of a capital flight that goes to Europe and I think South Africa, where the only other re reinsurer is. I think for me, those are the areas we really we need to be looking at. So, whatever we can keep back at home, we can. Finally, in terms of value addition, I, I, I see no harm. As working with with, with those who produce, or sorry, who process them outside. Let's do a deal. Let's ask them, why don't you come and set up your camp in our country? You know, we don't want a radical shift, like maybe Ghana tried to do, where you say, fully, we are saying nothing is going out completely. But have a gradual transition where you have a deal. Let the manufacturers come and pitch camp somewhere in our special economic zones as we gain, you know, gain scale and, and so on and grow, the, and, and grow the experience. Thank you. Can I add something? Yes. Very brief about value brief. addition. Yes. Because I think there's a bigger issue than uh, we are looking at it. I like the way my prof looked at it. I thought we, I thought we, we passed that junction of a value addition. We, need, we, we, need, we are going we need, back. We need to be more patriotic when we think of value, value addition because even if you value add, who is going to buy your product? So we need to do some very good blending. For example, if I broaden my coffee, get Ongori coffee, and somebody calls it, let's say, Risbon Coffee or Nescafe. It, people might not buy it just based on the name. And I remember that's what Trump did when he talked about America first. So we have been an, having an initiative, Buy Kenya, Build Kenya. How many, people, how many people buy that concept? And finally, 
I am, I'm very annoyed when you say that uh, banks are making money because they should not be making money. Banks should be reading to entrepreneurs, not reading the, bank, the government. That, that should be the essence of banks. We get money from the, from the banks, we expand our business, we create Absolutely. more jobs, not reading the government. Exactly. To pay, which, which is not that productive. Right. You want to say something? No, no, no. I, I, okay. I, 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 yes, I <laughs> But did, you would say I, something I said, after this. Yes. Where the cabinet has endorsed the sale of <laughs> the Development Bank of Kenya, DPK, handing a buyout opportunity to rival lenders with huge financial muscle. The sale of DPK and uh, Consolidated Bank of Kenya, another state-owned lender for privatization, could trigger another wave of mergers and acquisition that has characterized the fight for the top position among the big banks as part of the administration's plan to steer the turnaround for our state corporations and other state-owned enterprises by unlocking their potential and securing the best for the public cabinet considered and approved the proposed privatization of the development bank of kenya dbk and it reads uh, the cabinet dispatch the sector has recorded several mergers and acquisition with the latest being buyout of first community bank by premier bank somalia other major acquisitions include that of Jami Bora by Cooperative Bank, Spire Bank or by Equity Bank, and uh, Mayfair Bank by Commercial International Bank of Egypt. There's also the acquisition of the National Bank of Kenya by KCB Group. These acquisitions, together with others outside of Kenya, have intensified the fight for Kenya's top bank between KCB Group and Equity. The government has been trying to lighten its physical burden by selling some of its assets to private investors. It controls a 50% stake in Consolidated Bank and 89.3% at DBK. The initial plan was for the Treasury to merge DBK with the three other financial institutions, including the Industrial and Commercial Development Corporation, IDB Capital and Tourism Finance Corporation. However, the fact that it has been operating as a commercial bank swayed cabinet's decision. Uh, of course, we want to just get this into perspective. So this is a high vote from, uh, from KDC. Um, DBK is owned to the extent they have just mentioned in the public sector, 89% yes. is owned by KDC. Mm -hmm. 89%? Yes. That's a huge... Uh, so you can say KDC is holding the shares on the behalf of Treasury, on behalf of government. Um, it is a subsidiary of uh, KDC. It's been on the chopping block on the privatization list for a while. Uh, I do not know if anything new has really happened to push it to the front line of the news. But it has, it's been a candidate for privatization for uh, uh, quite a while. Um, uh, and I, I guess that's the direction to go. I wish they could do that quickly. There are many other institutions that ought to go onto that list. Unfortunately, there's, sort of the, uh, there's a tendency to blow hot and cold uh, on this one. Um, from time to time, sometimes Parliament uh, comes along, sometimes they don't. Sometimes Treasury wants to move that, sometimes they don't. And then, you know, there are always small, small interests that you, you know, there's always uh, issues around the political economy of these processes that might slow down, uh, slow down things. But yes, um, DBK, Development Bank of Kenya, has been uh, uh, on the privatization uh, list. And there's a new lease in the privatization after the new privatization commission was, just, uh, after the new law mm -hmm. was passed. Uh, so I think there's a tendency now to resuscitate those that had uh, sort of slowed, the process had slowed down uh, back into the active processes of, of uh, privatization. And I hope it happens quickly because then that helps really to make these institutions be net contributors to the economy rather than simply just sitting in a corner, uh, you know, calmly and, you know, uh, drawing from the economy and not putting it back enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tilling their thumbs. Yeah. Excellent, Iraqi. Yes. I find it interesting that uh, the first community bank was bought by a Somari bank. That's, that to me, looks a bit interesting. Not that I have anything against Somari. <laughs> But that's quite interesting. So I, I think I have nothing wrong with a bank being sold. In fact, if I had money today, from what we have been discussing here, banks are very profitable. If I had money, I would buy a bank today, mm -hmm. whether it is a Peruvian bank of Kenya or any other. And I think privatization is good in the long run because... You buy get, and, of course, give money to... 
whoever is supposed to be yes, giving, you lend the money. <laughs> of course, I would, I, would, I would turn it around and make a lot of money. <laughs> we have to see if you... Because that's one bright spot uh -huh. in Africa. Banks in Africa have done very well. EcoBank, Access Bank, Equity Bank, all the big, big, big banks in Africa have done very well. So it's a bright spot to import in, to, to invest in. Uh, and I think when you privatize banks and so other institutions, they become more efficient. And you create the jobs you are talking about. So why not try it? Mm -hmm. Right. I think there's nothing much. You want to want something? No, you the want to join me buying the bank? Yeah, well, <laughs> I we're, wish we could. We're still <laughs> waiting for the diaspora bank. Oh, because there is the diaspora <laughs> bank is actually in the pipeline as well. Yes, uh, but there is already one. There will be a DBK also. Uh, there's a DBK, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, is another DBK? Bank. <laughs> yeah. The, the for bank, a moment. <laughs> change the name. Uh, it, it's not a joke, but there is a uh, diaspora bank already in Ongatarongai, mm -hmm. the Unichoice microfinance bank. So there is one. Unichoice. Uh -huh. Yes, you, it, previously it was called. Uh, Choice Microfinance Bank. Uh, it since has got other investors who've come on board, taking a majority shareholding, so the name has changed. But yes, the Asperas have made an effort. But of course, it would still be nice to have a fully commercial bank, hopefully totally digital. Uh, but that's a story for another day. For DBK, obviously for chairman uh, and uh, as a government officer, really, he has to go with the grain of thinking of the cabinet. But I'm really wondering that what's going to be the effect of that on the role and functions that uh, KDC has been playing. I think last week we were seeing it's supporting the growth of certain industries. Indeed. What, how is it going to continue to get resources? But the ball, uh, I am one of those who doesn't take the view that always privatization is good. There are certain things that uh, if you have a good management and ensure good governance, there are public institutions that also still do very well. So my take is that I thought DBK had a special place focusing on development. I think there are countries which even have like agricultural development bank focusing in a particular niche. But uh, let's wait and see if this is going to excite some interest. And I'm hoping it's going to be sold at the Nairobi Stock Exchange. I'm excited. Yeah. So the, the, the let it be if yeah, it's yeah. going to be done publicly above board. Right. Yeah. Um the reason we had we have difficulty in uh, in uh, privatization is because people believe there is something that's not coming out you know this could be moved in a way that this is going to be a very profitable thing and it, therefore there is no need from an economic point of view um, uh, one advantage of moving an institution that makes money uh, from the private from the public to the private is that the dynamism that private sector moves money is higher than that of the public sector generally. Right, right. So if uh, the same billion here, when it goes here, it, it do, does a lot more than when it's sitting uh, in the public domain because there isn't that minute-to-minute uh, uh, -minute interest in moving the resources as much as they should. Um, but I want to assure uh, the chairman of the diaspora uh, international oh, yes. here that um, uh, there are there are many many um, institutions that are in the public domain that ought either to be completely shut down, absolutely, or given to a new mm -hmm. owner that will put life in them, and the taxpayer will not face the burden that they are facing. The patriotism that we put around these institutions is really not uh, worth it. That needs to be, uh, and you can't make. I, I don't want this to lead into a general statement. But just a specific statement that there are institutions that are better off off government hands in the public sector and the taxpayer will be better off. Now, we have made a comment here and we didn't have time to get into it to say banks, we, we were deriding the fact that banks are making money uh, buying bonds and so on, uh, government, government paper, rather than lending, uh, uh, you know, the process of uh, moving a billion through uh, lending to coffee farmers that want to establish <laughs> new farms <laughs> or uh, maize farmers that are going to expand this next season's crop uh, that will go through various processes before it ends up on uh, maize uh, flour on, on the shelf. Uh, yes, it is, it is desirable. But if you're in business, you're also looking for ways in which you can make money and stay, stay afloat. Right. We, we shouldn't condemn it uh, altogether. And in fact, it's sometimes because of the way we move the fundamentals in the economy. To make it more profitable to invest in that uh, government paper than to, to lend to that particular farmer. There are conditions that you can, do, you can improve progressively to reduce 
the scale of that shift. Thank you. Uh, Ad 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 Adam right. Smith, Adam Asim was very categorical in it. The government has no business doing business. But beyond the bank, I'm happy about Mombasa Beach, Sunset, my, 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 my baby, Sunset. The government has no business running hotels. Let me ask you, uh, what about, because you, you're talking about some of the entities, Kenya Year's book. The Kenya, Kenya Yearbook. Yeah, the Kenya Yearbook, yeah. Kenya Yearbook. Why, can it, why, why is it a standalone institution? Can, can it just be also but maybe so hived off and uh, put out in the Ministry of Culture? Yeah. National or, Library. Or National Library. Why yeah. do we have a Kenya, what does Kenya Yearbook? Who can summarize the functions of Kenya what Yearbook? If, yeah, can you tell us the functions of uh, Kenya Yearbook? Then we can and how is it exceedingly beneficial to the public? Of course, maybe in, in institutionalizing some of our, uh, and memorializing some of our major activities, but how is it contributing uh, the, to... The point I wanted to make, you you cut me short. All right. We would like these things to go that way, but the, the process should be above board. Mm. I think that's what Kenya is saying. Some of these institutions are leading a strain to the exchequer. Mm. And... Uh, Let's see the process go beyond board. Thank you. Yeah. Right. The, the Bala, Finally. For, for the hotels that are being disposed of, Sunset, as long as I can recall, has been like on the chopping board for the longest. But how come <laughs> it never got a suitor? What is going to be different that's it's going to make it attractive? It will be okay. Now, is it that the prices are going to be political? Yeah. So low? Maybe you're waiting for it to go down and you sell it for a song. So or so somebody, so, 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 so what is uh, Before Ranguma, uh, Ranguma? Yes, Governor. All right. I pushed him. Intercontinental Safari uh, Serena. Right. They actually wanted a branch right. in Kisumu. Kisumu. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. Lastly, we want to head to Japan, mm -hmm. where Japan's economy has slipped into a recession as it unexpectedly shrunk for a second straight quarter on weak domestic demand. Data showed on Thursday raising uncertainty about the central bank's plans to exit its ultra-easy policy sometime this year. The surprisingly weak performance saw Japan lose its title as the world's third largest economy, replaced by Germany. Gross domestic product uh, fell an annualized 0.4% in the October-December period after a 3.3% slump in the previous quarter. Government data showed it compared with a median market focused of 1.4% increase. Two consecutive quarters of contraction are typically considered uh, the definition of a technical recession. The weak data may cast doubt on the Bank of Japan's focus that rising wage or wages be, will rising wages will underpin consumption and justify phasing out its massive monetary stimulus. Right, we can just wind up with that. Uh, I think this is one of uh, the telltales of all also the world economy is doing Japan. Uh, yeah. One of a resilient economy in the world right now in recessions. Right? What does this really point to? I, well, the, when these uh, major economies go into recession, it has a major impact. Or it has an impact on smaller countries that uh, uh, rely, we rely on our exports to this country and when they're in recession, their capacity to import is also uh, diminished. That's one impact that we, uh, that we face. Um, but the, one of the things that we should learn from, uh, from this is the willingness of these countries to use data to derive decisions, to drive decisions, uh, and that the data has to be current enough. See, this is talk about two quarters in succession to the mean, for example, in the case of Japan, it's probably the period running through, if you are using calendar quarters, mm. running through December. And we are only in the first few days of uh, February. They already have results. They know they've been moving down. Our economies, we should also be making decisions along similar lines. But you see, we use data that sometimes June, I mean, not sorry, sometimes a year old, six months old, and so on. We have gone through recession, we are about to come out, now we are learning, and oops, we actually went in, you know. Uh, but the definition is standard, uh, two quarters, two, two successive quarters mm -hmm. uh, decline. Uh, uh, Automatically puts yes. you up uh, uh, Yes, and you don't have to debate list. it at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. you may debate about the data a bit, uh, we actually decline or not. But in our case, we sort of uh, keep quiet and then, you know, we come up and we think something has happened suddenly. But certainly the impact, uh, on a global scale, they, if the major importing countries are in recession, the levels of imports they can demand from you 
uh, our demand, our exports will tend to go down mm -hmm. because right. credit, credit availability will be uh, constrained. Um, th there will be all manner of austerity measures that might be in, be in place in the importing country, and therefore it affects the flow of businesses and so on. Uh, it's a concern for, for everybody. When they're growing and they're vibrant, uh, you know, we get happy uh, all the way to our, to our banks, all mm -hmm. the way to our food table sometimes, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, you want to weigh in just briefly yes, on this? Yes, we are, we it, then get uh, yes, closing remarks just it, briefly. It, interesting. The, the big economies, Japan, China, US, have as the locomotives of the world economy. So if they don't grow fast enough, then the rest of the world feels there is an, there's an impact across the, across the world. So, so, so one of the things we should be asking is, Japan is our trading partner. So that Japan is not doing very well. We may not, they may not import as much as we expect. We hope that is going to make the cars <laughs> become a bit cheaper. But all in all, one of the things I'm interested in is seeing how the, the Japanese economy will be stimulated. Maybe there's a, a lesson we can learn for our economy. Right. An economy that we rarely talk about is recession. I don't know why we never talk about recession in this country. Yeah, I can see someone uh, also commenting that uh, the president was just in Japan. Yeah. And now we have a recession. <laughs> 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 he walked away with the money. Uh, no, no, put up. Yes. Come to that actually. That continues. For us, Kenya, both Japan and Germany are our good friends. Mm -hmm. So whichever overtakes the other, I think we are still in good state. But yes, of course, I was hoping with a light touch that the 35 billion shilling goodies will not be affected at all. We just hope that is not... But, <laughs> but an important point that was raised of data, the ball, and maybe as I make my final remark, and Professor was talking of my second home, that's Rwanda. I think one of the things that Rwanda has really worked well on is the aspect of technology and data. I recall even just sport. I would have extended to agri-tech, but sport tech in particular. Rwanda did invest about $40 million in, I think, Asano to promote Visit Rwanda. More recently, they also invested, I think, $10 million in a French uh, uh, football club in terms of promoting sport. And I'm glad our sports ministry here is looking into bringing more technology into sports. So for me, if government continued to focus more on more technology in our critical sectors, agri-tech, sports tech, that's the way to go and create wealth and also create jobs for our young people. Thank why, you. Why don't they do it? And they know that is good. But uh, Japan, I think, uh, as, uh, can get uh, he can uh, upgrade his uh, Suzuki. Or is it uh, three weeks? Uh, you, need, you also need to remind the, the readers or the listeners that my name <laughs> Iraqi is very Japanese. Very Japanese yeah. indeed. Oh, Japanese. Tell us more. Yes. Is it? Yes, a Japanese. But name. I think the point we have to make even when you have an economy like that in recession, the capacity to bounce back is very high. You know, they are very strong economies anyway. You know? But that, like now the Toyota have done a breakthrough of the battery. And that is going to change the narrative, the whole world, how we to look at that. But I want to add this gentleman called Jordan Peterson, a Canadian psychologist author. In order to be able to think, and we, we are limited, I think the last time we say <laughs> we, are, we are limited how we think, right. I think it was you. In order to be able to think, you <coughs> must risk being offensive <laughs> with no apologies. Right. Right. Right, we close it at that. Uh, yes, Sako, maybe you can give us a closing remarks. Yes, I was just going to say that um, uh, this week is a sad week for having lost Kiptum. Yes. Um, really a rising star. So, and um, uh, in ways that I don't know if this was avoidable, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just destiny. But I think that's a big, a big loss. Um, I mean, secondly, back now on the, uh, on the cabinet decision, uh, decision they have. Um, I think that the cabinet must strive to keep decisions in the economy continuously current. There's no soft corner, there's no easy corner to sit in. Uh, I think this uh, push around the privatization, people see them in uh, uh, ownership of assets and what, what, it, uh, uh, what benefit gives those who buy and so on. I think they should look at it from the perspective of the health of the economy. And that must be continuously um, current, that has to stay current. And I said, if we doze off, uh, we'll go off the rates. We did. Maybe next time, maybe we can talk a little more about the, the yearbook, the yellow book.
pages, the poster. The There's poster. quite a bit in that regard. Yes. That could be turned into productive assets. Yeah, so we just go and do our homework and find out uh, what does the Kenya yearbook really tell, or maybe even get a CEO right. so that they can tell us more about the Kenya yearbook. Right. Excellent. This will be my last, my last comment. If you look through the window, it doesn't look very, very promising in terms of the weather. So the rain has not done as expected. Let's get also to get down to us what is happening. So we need to prepare for adverse effects if the weather does not turn as expected. Thank you. Right. Uh, it, but what goes to my mind is we need to be careful on our roads. Mm -hmm. That's how it all is like. Oh, fantastic. It, it's so sad. Because you get there, you hear people have died, we moan, but we are doing nothing on our roads. And also, please, if you could stop traveling during the night. Fantastic. Drunk cut you. Stupid people on the road. <laughs> but let's leave it at that. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate uh, your incisive, precise analysis on the matters economy right now, as it is. And uh, we hope to hear from you also more next week with the latest development as far as the state of economy is concerned. I want to thank you so much as well.